Start with a circle and look at the angle formed by two radii from the center. It's called a central angle because its vertex is at the center. It cuts off an arc whose length depends on the size of the angle. And this central angle cuts off this arc. The two central angles together fill the entire circle and form two straight angles, that is, two pi radians, or 360 degrees. This angle, with its vertex on the circle, is called an inscribed angle. It, too, cuts off an arc whose length depends on the size of the angle. Here's a surprising fact. The central angle that cuts off the same arc as an inscribed angle is twice as large. To see why, draw another radius. You get two isosceles triangles. These two angles are equal, and together they form part of the central angle. And these two angles are equal, and together form the other part of the central angle. So now we see that the central angle is indeed twice the inscribed angle. This charming result has many interesting consequences. For example, keep the central angle fixed and move the vertex of the inscribed angle along the circle. As the angle moves, it always cuts off the same arc and doesn't change its size because it's always half the central angle. Another consequence is a method that uses angles to draw circular arcs. Fix two points and move an angle so that its sides always touch these two points. The vertex of the angle will trace out part of a circle with a cord through the two fixed points. You can define an inscribed angle either by the arc it cuts off or by the cord. A given cord, however, can have two inscribed angles. These two inscribed angles are always supplementary. Why? because each is half its central angle, and the two central angles together fill the circle, forming two straight angles. There's another way to look at this. The measure of an inscribed angle doesn't change as you move its vertex along the circle. When you place the two inscribed angles together, they form a straight angle. No matter where the cord lies on the circle, the two inscribed angles cutting off that cord are supplementary. Now let's look at the special case where the central angle is a straight angle. The cord is a diameter and the inscribed angle is half a straight angle or a right angle. Therefore, any triangle inscribed in a semicircle with a diameter as one side is a right triangle and the diameter is its hypotenuse. So when you use angles to draw circular arcs and you want the two fixed points to be extremities of a diameter, use a right angle to trace out the arc. This property of right triangles inscribed in a semicircle leads to a remarkably simple proof of the law of sines. Start with this triangle and find the point equidistant from its vertices. Use this as center and draw a circle through the vertices. Let capital A denote the angle opposite this chord of length small a. The measure of the angle doesn't change if it cuts off the same chord while its vertex moves along the circle. Now move the vertex so that one side passes through the center of the circle. The triangle becomes a right triangle with its hypotenuse along a diameter. The length of the side opposite angle A is the hypotenuse times the sine of A. Therefore, this ratio is equal to the diameter. But the same argument can be applied to each of the other two sides. And we obtain the law of sines. When the diameter is equal to one, the length of a chord is equal to the sine of the inscribed angle. 
The law of sines is a property of similar triangles. If you compare a triangle inscribed in a circle of diameter one with a similar triangle of any size, the law of sines simply states that ratios of corresponding sides are equal. We now have another way to generate sine waves from circles. Here's how we did it in an earlier program with a circle of radius one. We plotted this height against the central angle. We can also use a circle of diameter one and plot the length of this chord against the inscribed angle. In an earlier program, we also learned that supplementary angles have the same sign by analyzing the symmetry of sine waves. There's an easier way to see this. Inscribe the angles like this in a circle of diameter one. Supplementary angles have the same sign for the simple reason that they cut off the same chord. The connection between signs and chords of circles goes back to ancient astronomy. Early astronomers were interested in chords of circles because they thought planets moved in circular orbits. The Greek mathematician Hipparchus wrote a treatise on chords of circles around 150 BC. This work is now lost, but many of the ideas survived in the Almagest, written some 300 years later by Claudius Ptolemy. The Almagest ranks with Euclid's elements as one of the great masterpieces of ancient times. Both were written in Alexandria, a magnificent center of Hellenistic culture, a city founded by Alexander the Great after he conquered Egypt in 331 BC. In the Almagest, Ptolemy derived a basic formula for the length of a chord cut off by the sum of two angles. We can discover this formula ourselves from the property of chords of circles discussed earlier. Remember, in a circle of diameter one, the length of any chord cut off by an inscribed angle is equal to the sine of the angle. So, if this angle is A, the length of this chord is sine A. No matter where A lies on the circle. Similarly, if this angle is B, the length of this chord is sine B, no matter where B lies on the circle. Now, bring the two angles together at a common vertex. They form a larger angle, A plus B, that cuts off a chord whose length is the sine of A plus B. To find the length of this chord another way, drop a perpendicular to the chord. It divides the triangle into two right triangles. The base of this right triangle is its hypotenuse times cosine B. The base of this one is its hypotenuse times cosine A. Putting these together gives the addition formula for sines. It says, the sine of A plus B is equal to sine A times cosine B plus sine B times cosine A. It tells us how to find the sine of a sum in terms of sines and cosines of the individual parts. Ptolemy himself proved the addition formula in another way, using a remarkable property of quadrilaterals that can be inscribed in a circle. A quadrilateral is a polygon with four sides. Not every quadrilateral can be inscribed in a circle, but for those that can, the product of the lengths of these two opposite sides plus the product of the lengths of these two opposite sides is equal to the product of the lengths of the two diagonals. This equation is called Ptolemy's theorem, and it can be interpreted geometrically in terms of areas of rectangles. The equation is true no matter where the vertices lie on the circle. Now let's see why Ptolemy's theorem is true. These two angles are equal because they cut off the same chord. Rotate this triangle until this diagonal of length E lies along this edge of length B. 
the two shaded triangles are similar. Likewise, these two angles are equal because they cut off the same chord. So rotating this triangle reveals another pair of similar triangles. If we rotate both triangles, we see that they join along a common side that divides this diagonal of length F into two pieces of length X and Y. Now we have two pairs of similar triangles, so ratios of these corresponding sides are equal. And ratios of these corresponding sides are equal. And the rest is just a little algebra. The final result is Ptolemy's theorem on quadrilaterals inscribed in a circle. Let's see what happens when the quadrilateral is a rectangle. These two opposite sides have equal length. These two opposite sides have equal length. And the two diagonals have equal length. Surprise, Ptolemy's theorem becomes the Pythagorean theorem for right triangles. The sum of the squares of the legs is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. Now we'll use Ptolemy's theorem to derive addition formulas for both the sine and cosine. Start with the circle of diameter one, take angle A and form a right triangle. The lengths of its legs are sine A and cosine A. Use angle B to form another right triangle. The lengths of its legs are sine B and cosine B. The two triangles together form a quadrilateral inscribed in a circle, with one diagonal being a diameter of length one. The length of the other diagonal is the sine of A plus B. Now apply Ptolemy's theorem. The product of the lengths of these two opposite sides plus the product of the lengths of these two opposite sides is equal to the product of the lengths of the diagonals. Presto, the addition formula for sines. To get an addition formula for cosines, first rotate this right triangle 180 degrees, so this diagonal is a diameter, and this triangle is a right triangle. The length of this leg is the sine of A plus B, so the lengths of this one must be the cosine of A plus B. Again, we have a quadrilateral inscribed in a circle, so we can apply Ptolemy's theorem. The product of the length of these two opposite sides plus the product of the lengths of these two opposite sides equals the product of the lengths of the two diagonals. When it's written this way, the result is the addition formula for cosines. It says the cosine of A plus B equals cosine A times cosine B minus sine A times sine B. We always gain new insights by drawing graphs. Start with a sine wave and multiply it by a vertical scaling factor. You get a new sine wave whose amplitude, large or small, depends on the scaling factor. Do the same with a cosine wave. If you add this scaled sine wave to this scaled cosine wave, the sum looks like this. No matter how much of each wave you combine, you always get a sine wave, possibly shifted or scaled. If the multipliers themselves are sines and cosines of some common angle, you can see the resultant sine wave marching along without changing its amplitude. The addition formula tells us that it's the same curve you'd get by taking the sine of a shifted angle. The addition formulas for sine and cosine have many applications. For example, let's see what happens when the two angles are equal. The results are called double angle formulas. 
This one says the sine of twice an angle is twice the product of the sine of the angle times its cosine. Let's see what this means graphically. The product of the sine and cosine is the area of this rectangle. From 0 to 90 degrees, both sine and cosine are positive, so the product is positive. It goes from 0 to a maximum, then back to 0. Here, the cosine is negative, so the product is negative. Here, both factors are negative, so the product is positive. And finally here, just the sine is negative, so the product is negative. The double angle formula says that if you multiply sine A times cosine A and scale by a factor 2, you get another sine wave with twice the frequency. Now look at the double angle formula for the cosine. The cosine of twice an angle is the square of the cosine of the angle minus the square of its sine. The right-hand side is usually written this way. Cosine squared A minus sine squared A. Again, let's look at the graphs. This is cosine squared. And this is sine squared. When you subtract cosine squared minus sine squared, the result is a cosine curve of the same amplitude, but twice the frequency. With the help of periodicity, we can extend these formulas to all values of A. When we replace B by negative B, the addition formulas are called subtraction formulas. Remember, the cosine of negative B is equal to cosine B. And the sine of negative B is the negative of sine B. The subtraction formulas for sines and cosines are the same as the addition formulas with just an algebraic sign change. The addition and subtraction formulas together provide a unifying source of properties that we've seen before. For example, if we make A equal to zero, or pi over two, or pi, and recall the values of the sines and cosines of these special angles, we get the following properties derived in another way in an earlier program. The sine of the supplement of B equals the sine of B. The sine of the complement of B is cosine B. And the sine of negative B is a negative of sine B. And from the addition formulas, the sine of pi plus B is a negative of sine B whereas the sine of pi over 2 plus b is cosine b. You can do the same sort of thing with the subtraction formula for cosines. There's one case that deserves special mention. When the two angles are equal, the cosine of 0 equals 1, and the subtraction formula becomes our old friend, the Pythagorean identity. When your pocket calculator displays the sine or cosine of 45 degrees, the result is only an approximation. To find the exact value, apply the Pythagorean theorem to this right triangle. The hypotenuse has length square root of 2. Divide the triangle in half, and we find the sine of 45 degrees is 1 half the square root of 2. So is the cosine. Sines and cosines of many special angles can be found exactly. For example, in this equilateral triangle, each angle is 60 degrees. Divide the triangle in half to find the sine of 30 degrees, which is also the cosine of 60 degrees. Use the Pythagorean theorem to calculate the length of this leg. Then we find the sine of 60 degrees, which is also the cosine of 30 degrees. The addition formula enables us to use the sine and cosine of two angles to find the sine of their sum. For example, using the sine and cosine of 30 degrees and 45 degrees, we can find the sine of their sum. Which is 75 degrees. And the subtraction formula gives us the sine of 15 degrees. These are also the cosines of the complementary angles. 
All these are exact values expressed in terms of square roots of whole numbers. To find more sines and cosines, we start with this regular pentagon. It has five diagonals of equal length. They form this star-shaped figure called a pentagram, an ancient Greek symbol of health. These five equal central angles fill a circle, so each is one-fifth of 360 degrees. This inscribed angle is half the central angle, or 36 degrees. The base angle of this triangle is also half its central angle, or 72 degrees. If these two equal sides have length one, what is the length of the base? We can find it with the help of Ptolemy's theorem. The product of the lengths of these two opposite sides plus the product of the lengths of these two opposite sides is equal to the product of the lengths of the two diagonals. We get a quadratic equation for x. It has two solutions, one negative and one positive. We want the positive solution. The length of the base is the square root of 5 minus 1 divided by 2. The Greeks called the ratio of these two lengths the golden ratio. We'll see it again in a later program. Now we can find the sine of 18 degrees, which is also the cosine of 72 degrees. And we use the Pythagorean theorem to find the sine of 72 degrees, which is also the cosine of 18 degrees. Because we know the sine and cosine of 15 degrees and 18 degrees, the subtraction formulas give us the sine and cosine of 3 degrees. Then by repeated use of the addition formulas, we can find the sine and cosine of 6 degrees, 9 degrees, 12 degrees, and, and all integer multiples of 3 degrees. The addition formulas are also used to analyze oscillations called simple harmonic motion. When a body such as a marble rolling in the bottom of a bowl, or a mass oscillating at the end of a spring is disturbed from rest, a force opposing the motion tries to return the body to its starting point. But inertia causes the body to overshoot this point, and the body keeps going and begins to oscillate. Back and forth, or up and down. If the restoring force is proportional to the displacement, it is known that the displacement, as a function of time, is a combination of a sine wave and a cosine wave, as in this example, which is a combination of 2 sine t plus cosine t. This can also be expressed as a scaling factor c times the sine of a shifted angle, t plus alpha. To find c and alpha, multiply both sides of the addition formula by c and compare coefficients of sine t and cosine t. Look at the right triangle with legs 2 and 1 and use the Pythagorean theorem to find c. The angle alpha has these numbers as cosine and sine. The same argument can be applied to a more general combination, a times sine t plus b times cosine t, giving these relations for c and alpha. In this program, we learn that properties of chords of circles lead to addition formulas that are used to calculate sines and cosines of special angles. They also play a fundamental role in analyzing simple harmonic motion. Claudius Ptolemy was only one of many scholars who thrived in the magnificent city founded by Alexander the Great. The young king died before Alexandria was completed but a Macedonian general named Ptolemy Soter began a dynasty that transformed Alexandria into a major center of Hellenic culture, surpassing the Academy of Athens. It was here that Claudius Ptolemy, no relation to the rulers, wrote the Almagest nearly five centuries later. Many great mathematicians flourished in Alexandria, including Euclid, Apollonius, and Eratosthenes. After the death of Cleopatra, the last Ptolemaic queen, Egypt was reduced to a Roman province with Alexandria as its capital. Alexandrian mathematics came to an end in the Christian era. The city's last mathematician was Hypatia, 
known for eloquence and learning and for beauty that rivaled Cleopatra's. Because Hypatia would not forsake the gods of ancient Greece, she was brutally murdered by a mob in 415 AD. In the next program, we'll see how sines and cosines can be calculated to a high degree of accuracy using polynomial approximations, the way it's done in your pocket calculator. We'll also learn about slopes and areas associated with sine and cosine curves. This will give us a glimpse into one of the most exciting and profound areas of mathematics, the world of differential and integral calculus.